Well, when I did it, people were still asking, why are you throwing your life away and doing this thing when it just nobody recognizes it? There was no boards in it. There was no, it was, it was really viewed as a uh, kind of like a, a place for the lost souls to go, but not, you wouldn't seek it out. When I, when I trained in pediatrics primarily, I had a chairman who was pretty uh, erudite. And he said there were two kinds of pediatricians. There were firemen and there were farmers. And the farmers were the nurturers, the primary care, uh, so specialists who could take their time in working things up and arriving at a diagnosis. And then there were the firemen, or women, who needed answers and action and a different kind of rhythm. And uh, the secret of life was knowing what group you belonged in. And I knew I was a fireman. I love it for a lot of reasons. One is because I like thinking on my feet. And I think the real skill that you have to have to become an emergency physician is to learn how to to think. You know, people often ask, what's the, what's the special body of knowledge in emergency medicine? And I think that's really the wrong question. Most specialties have a special something. It's not always knowledge. Mostly we have a skill. And the skill is not a manual skill, it's a, it's a cognitive skill. It's how to make decisions based on limited information in time acute situations. I really liked intellectually the idea of trying to be the master of the first two hours of anything that walked in the door. That, that, that intellectual challenge is, I think, what, one, of my, what, one of my drivers. Well, we want the action, we like the energy level, we like the juice, uh, but it's a crazy thing to like. It's, you know, it's like the Woody Allen uh, joke. A guy goes to his uh, doctor, he says, you gotta help me, doc, my brother's crazy. Doc says, what's wrong with him? He says, well, he thinks he's a chicken. He said, chicken? He goes, yeah, he thinks he's a chicken. He said, yeah, well, bring him in and I'll cure him. He said, we can't, we need the eggs. And that's it. <laughs> I can't explain it. USC was the place it was big, it had huge pathology, it was you know, one of the biggest hospitals in the country. So the idea of doing it there sounded like that would be cool. And it turned out that the um, bad thing was we didn't have any faculty of any who were at all competent. I came from a tradition, both in medical school and in residency, uh, before that, that um, you know, grand rounds was the most boring thing you could possibly ever sit through. And it was some expert on some on the upper pole of the left kidney and who didn't know anything else except for the upper in winter in winter the upper how this is how it acted and he gives some lecture about some topic that you know everybody would be trying desperately to stay awake the faculty was embarrassingly bad their their skill set and knowledge base was just lacking one of them was a, a psychiatrist nice fellow well intended but a psychiatrist who know you know was interested in emergency medicine but didn't know anything about emergency medicine. When I first got there, attendings weren't expected to be in the department all the time. When they were on shift, they were expected to be nearby so that you could call them if you wanted. That was true except for the weekends and nights where they weren't there at all. Um, but you supposedly could call them if you, if you wanted. You, you knew you were smart enough to know never to do that, <laughs> pretty much. So it was really a matter of the residents taught the residents, and the senior residents taught the junior residents, and the faculty were really irrelevant. In the United States, there was no real system of, of retrieval of wounded or trauma patients on the highways and byways. What changed that was the report in 1966 called uh, Trauma, the Neglected Disease of Modern Society. That changed everything because it said you could be wounded in the jungles of Vietnam and survive more likely than if you were wounded on the streets of, and, and byways of, uh, of uh, America. They criticized every element, including the training of physicians. That resulted in a major funding increase uh, across the country, which allowed for emergency medicine residents, for example, and so on. But there were well-intentioned and, uh, and good people, not to say the others weren't, but good people who believed that emergency medicine did not have a core knowledge base to be an academic specialty, that they felt that, that it was borrowing from other uh, places, that other specialties, and really these were 
we could do that job better than they could down there because we're specialists in that. What they didn't see was they were retrospectively looking at the patient's problem. And, uh, and any one of them, if you put them in the emergency department, even with, a, with a, a complaint which might well have proven referable to their specialty, they would have missed it, or they would have not realized the importance of the presenting symptoms. Let's say a young infant, uh, well, make it a child or young adult, comes in with a broken arm or a complicated laceration that we can fix in the emergency department, but we want to provide anesthesia and sedation to ameliorate the pain and make it a better procedure. You go back 10, 15 years, you'd have to call the anesthesia people downstairs to administer the drugs that are used for sedation and pain management. But over the last decade, it's, it's a fact at this point that emergency physicians, pediatric notwithstanding, all, all types, are the experts in taking people out of pain and managing what we call procedural sedation. We had a few meetings with anesthesia departments years ago to see if we were qualified and they realized that we were overqualified. We've done so many more than they have upstairs in their own operating rooms that that battle's over. So the way we've won every battle of turf is by being available, never turning anyone down, developing a curriculum to learn how to do it, developing a quality method to see how you're doing it, and reporting back to the hospital as such. The way you break down barriers is contact. And uh, when people don't know what you do, they assume you do nothing. And that's human nature. So once they see what you do, it's just butter. I've been doing this so long, and I turn around and I look at all the skills that we just do. And without opposition, you know, nobody's banging our door down to say, hey, you can't do that. From central lines to IV access to sonography to CAT scans, uh, preps to sedation to chest tubes, it's amazing. We not only do it, but we do it well with an organized curriculum on how to teach it. And how we win, and we won those turf wars, was quite simple. We're there 24-7. It's amazing how people protect their turf when the sun's out. But when it gets dark out, they'll go, well, you're okay at night. Well, now we're okay all the time. I think there's, a, at least in a lot of emergency medicine, although I'm pretty sure not all of it, there's a sense that patients are important and, and that we have to treat them with respect and humanity. And even that, that, that involves taking care of their symptoms, not looking at them as as the enemy, not looking at them as cheaters and liars who are going to get us to do the wrong thing. I think the best way to look at our place in the medical hierarchy would be to understand that uh, what people realize now is that most emergency departments are responsible for over 75% of the admissions to this ho the hospital you're in. So we are not, we are rather, the front door. Get over it. It's not the fancy lobby with the fountain and the donors and the benefactors on the wall. It's our little drive through and we are the front door. So what does that mean? That means that people come through and they get processed. And over 99% of the patients who get admitted through the emergency department have the correct diagnosis made. We've, we nailed it. We figured it out with technology, intellect, and approach. In my mind, what I've seen in my experience, in my little world, um, I think a few things in the culture have changed dramatically for the better. One is that it we, we're, we hold ourselves to a higher standard than we used to. Um, people didn't like to make mistakes ever, but that was mostly because I didn't want to feel bad about myself. But I think now there's much more of a sense of, you know, you, you can't hurt people. We have a real responsibility that's important. When I first started, there was no CT scanning, and um, people with, particularly people with head injury, were really a challenge because the ones who were really sick were obvious, but most of them were really sick, and they ended up fairly poorly. You really, it was important to get to some of them quickly, to those not okay, not really sick, to get to them before they really deteriorated, and there was no good way to do that. CT scan came along, and my God, you knew the answer. It was really quick and easy and correct. So that was a huge, huge difference. Ironically, I, I now believe that the way we currently use CT scans, we probably would be better off as a society. Our patients would be better off if we didn't have it. That's a bizarre thing to say, and maybe, it, maybe it's an overstatement, but 
I think we do a lot of harm with CT scans. And it's not just from the radiation, which I think is trivial compared to other harms. I think we do a lot of harms with advanced technology, the way that we go looking for things and finding and treating things that we think are dangerous because they carry a name that's supposed to sound dangerous. But in fact, we're finding them at such trivial levels that they're not dangerous. We'd be better off not finding them. The, the treatment's worse than the disease. The better the technology, the more trivial things we'll find. So for me, this, the, the, it's, it's a little bit of an irony. That it's the same thing that is most harmful as the thing that was the biggest great change. CT scan was great. I think the pressures that they're under now are to blend uh, physical exam skills with the technology. You know, it's very easy to be seduced by, okay, I'm not sure what's wrong with your abdominal pain, we'll just scan you. And old school would examine, laying on the hands, and I'm not saying we don't do that anymore, but I think that it's a skill set you want to keep. Most of health is not related to healthcare. And most of the big challenges with health, the, the Western world has solved long since. And yes, at the margins, there are good things we can do in healthcare, in advanced healthcare. But that's not as important as having schools. We need to continue to realize that the most important thing we do is provide comfort. We occasionally do big things like save a life, but that's rare. Mostly what we do is we recognize important diseases, we recognize who's sick and who's not, and we're able to provide comfort to both of them. The ones who are sick, we're also able to provide care, um, medical care, in some cases important, some cases less important. The ones who aren't sick, we do a really important job. We take care of their symptoms, we take care of their fear and their anxiety, and um, we're gonna have to uh, avoid the notion that we're, we're not physicians, we're um, high-level technicians who do all sorts of fancy stuff. Because there's a big trend in America and in American medicine to want to make physicians into fancy technicians who, who use robots to, to do big procedures. And I think that's the worst thing we can do. And I, I, it has nothing to do with what's important about a, my job. We take care of populations that don't have access to care. They often visit us uh, for a myriad of reasons that, that someone who's plugged into the medical sustainable system would never think about coming to an emergency department. And I feel like I have a front row to the end of the world at times, that, that I just see people at their worst, in their worst situation, physically, emotionally, and mentally. Uh, and I have to balance uh, that reality with the reality of my own life where things aren't that bad. It's just that that eight hours was a bit strenuous. But we have generations of children now who are raised to consider the emergency department as a source of primary care. And we suffer from our own graciousness. I would never chastise anyone for using the emergency department. Like, you shouldn't have come in. Because maybe that next day they have to and they get inhibited by my judgment. Uh, but in reality, they shouldn't have come in. They could have waited. But if the roof is leaking, don't blame the water. Fix the system. Absolutely. I love, I can't think I, uh, of a better career. I've been deliriously happy with what I do for a living. In a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. I think it's an extraordinarily difficult job. I, th I admire greatly the physicians who do it year after year with grace and don't take it out on the patients. And um, I've become really good doctors. What sticks out to me is... Um, Every single encounter I have, you're taking people in their most vulnerable situation. Whether they abuse us or not, that's not my point. You're taking the most valuable commodity in the world, their child. They're coming to a strange healthcare scenario with people they don't know and trust. Their only information database about emergency medicine is from television shows or whatever. And they come in and in comes me or a resident that could look very young and inexperienced or whatever. And within a certain period of time, I have to earn their trust, demonstrate competency and care and disposition, and make it a positive experience for them. That is a privilege for me. That is, I've taken this entirely horrific situation and molded it. And that's my challenge every day. When I go in a room, I treat everyone like they were my child. And how would I would feel being here, scared, terrified or whatever. That's, that's where the money lies. That's Because anybody could write the orders and get the tests. Your job 
is to provide mental, physical, and medical comfort, and that involves family care. And again, I'm a pediatrician at heart. That's where I'll always be. So I'll go to my grave knowing that I, um, I took good care of people. People ask me about cases, and I, I, I honestly, maybe there's something wrong with me, but I don't remember about a lot of them. Um, it's just the totality of this thing that um, makes it kind of like um, it's such a special um, specialty, I think. I really admire the people who do it well. I think it's really hard. I mean, I think it's easy to be an orthopedist, relatively speaking. You know, you get the five journals of orthopedics that there are, they're written in big print, and you learn to become a mechanic and you do it. Um, but emergency medicine isn't like that. And there's always gonna be needles in the haystack that uh, surprise you and, um, and make you, geez, I almost missed that one, because it was close. And you never get over that. It's gonna happen whether you practice five years or 25 years. There's always gonna be a case that's going to challenge you and make you humble. Look at the job description. You have to be willing to work nights and weekends, holidays, all the time. You have to say yes to every patient, no pre-screening whether they can pay or not. You have to believe what they say at face value initially, even they may have secondary gain in line. They may be half dead when they roll in or not, and you have to basically do the same job every day, try to not do too many tests and spend money, and yet never miss anything. What fool would take that job? There was a newsroom uh, episode this year, one of Sorkin's new shows, and the last um, episode was called, uh, uh, the title of it was, I think it was called The Precious Fool. And they talked about people who would always be idealistic about what the country could be or whatever. In medicine, emergency medicine is a lot like that, where you're the perfect fool. You think every 20 minute interchange can make a difference. And the funny part is it does.